On this episode, we discuss Hawk the Slayer. The movie that dares to ask the question, what if you watched your friends play D&D for an hour and a half, but you didn't get to share their Doritos? <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to the Flop House. I'm Dan McCoy. Hey Dan McCoy, it's me, Stuart Wellington. Over here is Elliot Kalen. Usually I'd waste a lot of time doing some kind of bit where I introduce my name and it takes a while, but we don't have time for that because I wanted to introduce our special guest star for this episode, an actual, honest to goodness, television superstar. That's right, <laughs> superstar, I said. You may know her as the creator and star of The Guild. You may know her as a best selling author. You may know her. But you do know her as King of Forrester on Mystery Science Theater 2000, The Return for Netflix. Very excited to have Felicia Day with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey! Thanks for having me! <laughs> now, I'm Felicia... Really what? What? What, no, Dan? Sorry, Dan, I, Dan I, our I, guest has barely started <laughs> talking. Well, I had You've already no, I had an opening monologue. It seemed I like had, she had like... paused, but I... Yeah, I know. I'm. Th- this is historically my job on the show, is to do things wrong. Oh, so. okay. I'm very good. I'm mes- I've never... <laughs> been i'm usually best um kept like i want to be a street urchin for the rest of my life every D D character is street urchin street urchin street urchin and it's just so i don't have to do my hair and makeup no all i wanted to say was i of course uh am the biggest fan of felicia from her work on uh buffy and dr horrible but oh. I, would be, I would be remiss in uh not mentioning that during the quarantine a lot of people are doing watch alongs my friend had a watch along of for her birthday of all of the Bring It On movies, and I was delighted <gasps> to see her as the goth cheerleader in the second oh, of those no. films. Oh, no. I was the goth cheerleader, cheerleader healed by cheer. Like, I was yeah. the goth ballerina <laughs> here by, healed by cheer, basically. That was a blast from the past. That was a weird... <laughs> That was a weird, that was a weird job. That's when I did, that's when I realized, uh-huh. not realized it, but I did wonder why the director would hit on everybody. Mm. <laughs> Mm, we won't go yeah. into that, though. You're hearing the Hollywood goss on the <laughs> yeah, show. Yeah, exactly. The behind the... BTS. <laughs> <laughs> well, should we explain what we do, or do we want to talk about stuff? Yeah, we should... We should, we should probably explain what we, what we do. I mean, okay. Dan, I, Dan how, how many years have we been doing this show? Uh, it is about 12 years, I guess. <laughs> wow! And, and yet, it's each almost time... Almost 13. Almost 13, and yeah. each time it's as if you've never done it before. <laughs> I you have a freshness about you, Dan. Like you've that's... never been behind a mic before, and that's, uh, that's really that's really impressive that uh-huh. you've been doing this thirteen years. It's like somebody bonked him on the head, and there were little birds tweeting around him, and then mm-hmm. they pushed him onto a microphone. And he just started riffing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It, it provides kind of a ramp sh- ramshackle feel to the show, so people think that we're just their idiot friends. See? Listen, yeah, we sh- I love, like I said, unpolished is my, my specialty. There's nothing worse than trying to look good. You know you have a booger in your nose. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You walk mm-hmm. out, you got toilet paper in your shoe. And yet, if you're <laughs> the guy your who shoe. points your, or the guy or, or, or lady who points their nose and goes, check it out, a booger, you're everybody's best friend all of a sudden. Like, oh, if you can call yourself you out on it. You call yourself on it? Because I always tell yeah. other people, and then they get mad at me that I told them. And I'm like, did you want to go home and see that was in your nose and imagine all the people that <laughs> saw you with a booger in your nose and just go over and over and over and, and, and over in your mind all night? It, I mean, that's what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I just stare, in, stare into the dark corners of the room, mm-hmm, thinking mm-hmm. about all the mistakes you've made and... Oh man! Yep. No, no, Stuart, get out of that dark Stuart. place. Stuart, in, in, in Stuart get out of the pit. I can't believe I said that thing. Are you doing oh your God, bit? He's weeping. From he's weeping. The live show again? <laughs> oh boy! Okay. Uh, well, maybe, so Hawk the Slayer. Guys. So maybe Dan, what do we do? What do we do on the on this podcast? Uh, this is a podcast where we watch a bad movie and we talk about it. You know, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I always feel bad that uh, the concept is baked into the podcast, but it's also prejudging the film because I don't know what these guys thought of it. But um, but mostly they're bad movies. The movies that we have been led to believe are not so good. So you don't like do a Godfather situation here, or you're not like watching, you know, Schindler's maybe, List. Maybe the I third mean, one. The third Schindler's List, the direct-to-video one where it's dogs. <laughs> There's, there was a direct, really? 
Wow, that's one that I don't think people have reviewed. I don't I have to look on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, that's it's a real, very, very low. Schindler's rated. Twist. Oh Ooh, shit! No, not uh, a fan. So, what? but well, you're, you're making a face as if you were not the person who introduced the idea of a, a directed video sequel to Schindler's List, and yet I, I am the one who gets. Uh, gets uh, You're right. reprimanded. Fair, fair point. Fair point. We're all sinners in this world. Uh, I, w- I will say, I think at time of release, this movie was not particularly thought of well by critics, and I mm. think it was a box office bust. Uh, now, I think it I, is no. found a follow. This yep. is a movie that I came know. out in 1980, and I was curious how well it did. So I looked up on Box Office Mojo by IMDb Pro. Uh, I don't know why I'm giving them brand name sponsorship, but uh, the... I looked up domestic box office for 1980, and it was not in the top 68 releases of that year. Wow. That's that's as far as the chart goes. Uh, but back in the back in 1980, they released thousands upon thousands of movies, right? That's true. That's true. Uh, they had the drive-in theaters, right? This was like number one in Topeka on the west <laughs> side. <laughs> not on the east side of Topeka. Oh wow! Oh yeah. no. It's weird that I don't they know split which percentage those, of peak is better, but yeah. <laughs> split those demos up for the purposes of box office reporting. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the, like, basically one of the stars' families lived. Yeah, wow. so they all went to see it. Uh, but yeah. this movie also, so the movie we're watching is Hawk the Slayer. I have a question for Stuart about it in a moment. Uh, but uh-huh. first, this actually has a previous Flophouse connection in that it was directed by uh, the director Terry Marcel, whose daughter, Kelly Marcel, wrote... The Fifty Shades of Grey movie, which we did on this very what? podcast. So wow. I can see connections. Yeah. Wait, so. it was written by that's whose jo- the daughter wrote it, and the dad or the mom wrote this movie. No, no, the the dad directed this movie. Directed and also I think, the movie, and, I, okay. and he may have co-written it. Let's see. Let me take a yeah, look. Yeah, he did. Yeah, it's, and he co-wrote it and wrote and directed it, and then his daughter went on to become a screenwriter as well. So it's a schlock legacy. Oh yes. Oh, very much so. It's. Uh, a proud family tradition, I guess is the way mm-hmm. you'd call it. Now, yeah. S- Stuart, my question for you is, Hawk the Slayer, you were very big on... We uh, we asked Felicia, what kind of movie would you like to do? And she said, fantasy, please. And Stuart said, Hawk the Slayer in big capital letters in a text. Now, what was mm-hmm. it about this movie that, that really had you you going? So there's, uh, you know, I have a couple of connections to Hawk the Slayer. Uh, it's mentioned in uh, the first season of Spaced, uh, you know, the Edgar Wright show. And I remember being like, what the fuck are they talking about? So I had to look it up. And <laughs> then uh, I used to, when I, when I worked for, uh, yeah, I was really mad at the show. Uh, I turned my TV to face the wall. And uh, I, when I worked for Games Workshop, I had some uh, English co-workers who were uh, big fantasy nerds. And they also, you know, they... We're fans of Hawk the Slayer for some reason. Uh, and then the third reason I mentioned it is the exact day you texted me, uh, somebody told me their brother suggested we should do Hawk the Slayer for the show. Wow. And I thought Thank it would you, be like, random person's brother. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. I feel like, <laughs> I mean, he's probably going to listen now, but I, I feel like, like I want him to be surprised and be like, oh my God, like by mentioning it to this other person and then mentioning, you know, like that, his his tel- his game of telephone actually paid off. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's like, "What kind of power do I have that I spoke it and it came into uh-huh. being?" Yep. Now, uh, on a similar line of questioning, this is uh, with some big exceptions, fantasy is is not necessarily my genre. Mm-hmm. But uh, Felicia, I know that uh, I mean one of your first ways of coming to prominence was uh, the Guild. Is it? And you said fantasy. Is it something that you particularly connect with? Oh, yeah. I live in another world. My life okay. is a fantasy. <laughs> I have read every fantasy novel there is. I have watched most things that are fantasy-based. I even watched the Shannara show for a while, okay. and that was, that was wretched. So <laughs> I will do anything with a sword or a drape or a, a, a horse or a turret. I mean, I am like a sucker. I'll watch a little bit of anything. I am a, a turret whore. <laughs> so, like, and I know a lot about history, so I realize it is just a fictional account. Like, it's literally like if people wrote about our time and, and it was like the Jetsons. You know, like, it's so far removed from reality uh, yeah. that, that, that we've created a fictitious universe that is this chivalrous sort of time where women were so happy (laughs) (laughs) they weren't dead bodies everywhere everyone didn't stink but at the same time i love it and that's my it's sort of like a fairy tale kind of thing so yeah i i have watched a lot but i did not watch this movie and thank god for the introduction to it thank god (laughs) oh you're you're welcome 
I think uh, we're going to have an interesting dynamic here uh, between those of us who probably enjoyed the movie and those of us who did not enjoy the movie as one co-host who will be named later texted me multiple times while watching it <laughs> with his disgruntlement. It wasn't Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> But we'll get to that. Let's talk about it. Okay. Listener, listeners, write in. <laughs> write in with your guesses. Stop the podcast right now. Write in with your guesses. Write, was it Dan, care of Dan McCoy, 123 <laughs> Any Street, New York City, Brooklyn, uh, 10111111111111111111, USA, uh, Earth, America? I don't want to give too many spoilers too early. I will say it's not so much dislike as boredom, but we'll, we'll get to mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. All right, interesting. Well, let's talk about hmm. Hawk. This let's talk about the Hawk, which is, I guess, probably should have been the slogan on the poster because yep. the slogan on the poster says, uh, "Beyond the edge of darkness, there is a world of sword and sorcery." But it should have been, "You're going to talk about the Hawk." That should yeah, have been the slogan, I figured I it'd be like, yeah. "Can you talk the Hawk, or will you hawk the talk?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. That's even better. That's yeah. even better, dude. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some people walk the walk. This guy talks the Hawk. And people are like, wait, so he talks to hawks? No, 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 no. That's not what it's about. And with Lady Hawk coming out, I think that was probably later. That totally owes all of it. All the hawkdom is owed to the... And then the third movie in the trilogy, uh, Hudson Hawk. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. It was just a a generation of hawkdom. And this was really the, the, the bird of the decade. Look who's yeah, talking, yeah, in the look 80s, who's talking people, too. People love talking. Yeah. <laughs> that was a story about a baby who got into falconry, right? <laughs> and the baby was holding like a little glove with a little baby falcon on it, which now that I think about it is kind of the plot of Kez, which is a terribly sad movie. Okay, so Hawk the Slayer. We open with an opening title that has some kind of epic myth stuff that, you know, just kind of say basic stuff. We don't need to get into it. I didn't write it down. Uh, because quickly we are introduced to the villain of the piece. That's right, Voltan the Dark One. Jack Palance, wearing a helmet that covers half his face because they, I guess, didn't have the makeup budget for his heavily scarred face to be on screen for more than a, you know, the minute at the end of the movie. Uh, Voltan is infiltrating a castle. He wants his dad's secret to ancient power. And how would you describe the room that his dad is in? <laughs> it's probably where Trump takes a poop. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's a great, yeah, it's got gold, shiny gold walls, and there seems to be some kind of dry ice hot tub just in the middle with, like, gold yeah. statues over it. I love this more than anything in this scene is the two, there's two sort of gargoyles on either side of the hot tub, and they have this look like they're a kid from 1980 doing a headshot. <laughs> it's like that cute, it's the cute little two fists under the chin going, hey. <laughs> so I actually rewatched the whole sequence just looking at the gargoyle's face. <laughs> it, it feels so much like they wanted a, a creepy gargoyle, but all they could get was like little angel statues, and they were just like paint them gold, stick them on the hot tub. What are you going to do? Come on. Yeah, I. Uh, this is the kind of room that if I was uh, playing a game of True Dungeon and this was the last chamber, I would not be super bummed about it, but I wouldn't be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I've done True Dungeon. That's amazing. I That's figured somebody too. would appreciate it. Ten people and me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Not me, Stuart. Thumbs down to that reference. Not in my so, wheelhouse. So so Voltan is fighting his dad, right? And now, they look roughly, roughly two years apart. <laughs> and, and Voltan seems older than his dad. And now this is, yep. I think, the main issue with casting Jack Palance as your villain, but then deciding that the villain and the hero should be brothers. Because Jack Palance... By this time, let's see, this is 1980. He was 61 years old at the time. And oh, my. He is, he, and uh, you do not want a 61-year-old hero. Uh, and so yeah. you end up with some very old brothers. He looks to be about a little bit older than his dad. And uh, he, he wants the secret to ancient power. Uh, and his dad is like, no way. And while he's arguing with his dad... Hawk is, is this when Hawk, one of the times when Hawk is riding on his horse for a very long time? Yeah, it's like exterior darkness, interior light. He's, so he's like two time zones over, but somehow just arrives. It's amazing. I'm like, what? Why is the castle at midnight? And then he's like, it's golden hour. It doesn't make any sense. 
No, it's it's and uh, they do. I don't remember if they do it here, but they do met a number of times. Hawk will be riding on his horse, and they'll just cross dissolve to him riding on his horse, and then they will half dissolve <laughs> him riding on his horse with the image of him riding on his horse. And it's like, uh, it, it felt like they were they they really wanted to make the most of this this Hawk uh, riding horses footage. Hawk, I'm but there's always a lizard watching him. You <laughs> yeah, a lizard that? or a snake. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's a disco. It's disco lizard. So basically, disco lizard watches Hawk ride and- through the woods. <laughs> As long as we're talking about Hawk riding through the woods, which is approximately 90% of the movie, I also would like to say that every exterior in this movie is a, a patch of the woods that basically looks like the other patch of the woods we just saw with uh, about, like, let's say 10 smoke machines on overdrive making and this often, in the background. And often Holly, uh, uh, Halloween adventure skulls just tied <laughs> to trees. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. There's so many bones tied to trees in this movie. But anyway, Hawk shows up. A uh, hawk bursts in too late. The dad is is dying. Voltan left, I guess, and the old man gives Hawk his magic stone that he kept in an amulet around his neck. Voltan couldn't crack that code. No, that maybe... well, he, could, he couldn't get the sword off the wall either. He didn't even try. He just yeah. was like, Dad, you're dead. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the stone goes into the... So the handle of the sword, which is called the mind sword, for reasons that are never really explained, I guess because you can control uh-huh. it with your mind, it's a hand, and the hand opens up and holds this glowing stone, and his dad is like, now you've got the power, and you're going to use this. And Hawk wills the sword to his hand, and it floats over, and that's when <laughs> we get the title, Hawk the Slayer, drawn by hand, as if it is the first bootleg, like, EP <laughs> release of a heavy metal, of like a hometown heavy metal band, and it is copyright Chips Productions, which is maybe my, fa- my favorite thing yeah, that, that I've ever seen. Yeah, that was my favorite. I was like, Chips? <laughs> What else have they done? This is, did they do chips later? Is this just kind of like their side project? And this We're is an English. This is an English movie, so that means it's copyright French Fries Productions, which is even better. <laughs> um, and I'm going to go out on a limb right now. I mean, the instant this movie started, I was like, "Movie, I'm I'm totally yours." But then when the theme song started playing, I, the, oh, yeah. the music is genuinely is amazing. It's it's no no the music. I actually would I would listen to the soundtrack. I it is genuinely up. amazing. It's disco <laughs> tech somehow. Yeah. It should be like Tron, you know, like it's not, it's not appropriate for anything that's on screen. <laughs> I it's tried really to, quite good. Yeah. I tried to see whether it was available for purchase. Actually. I mean, you can get it as MP3s, but not in any other format, but I was like, yeah, it's like disco. Uh, some, some of it sounds like the Disneyland Main Street Electrical Parade. Some of it sounds like Ennio Morricone. Like, it's way different than anything you, like, would see in a modern fantasy film or hear well, more, The Morricone comment's interesting because I think, uh, reading up on the trivia behind it, I guess they were trying to go for, like, they were trying to go for, like, a western but set in a like a fantasy sword and sorcery realm, and then that was like, clear. That was clear with the long, expressionless close-ups they kept cutting back and forth. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, are they trying to do a spaghetti western with like? And I was like, wow, that would have been cool had it worked in any way. Yeah, the, the ways the only way it works is the music, and when they show people shooting crossbows, and they and oh, it's, just it's like, amazing. And those it's my are favorite thing in the world. Yeah. it's my favorite thing in the world. Those crossbows because they're machine gun crossbows. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. and it's just them showing the same piece of footage over, like cut really close yeah. together. And when uh-huh. and less, I've never seen an elf shoot arrows so fast. Sorry, oh, no, Legolas. I was like, why does anyone have a sword in this world? Yes, you all yeah. be using machine gun arrows or yeah. crossbows. <laughs> Like they, I'm like nobody can hold a candle to this one-handed crossbow uh-huh. artist yeah. over here. Yeah, He's well, that's amazing. one way in which this fantasy medieval world is better than the real world. Is there's a waiting period for crossbows in this universe? Oh, so, oh I see. Uh, okay, yeah, that they close sense. that loophole, that yeah. bolt hole. Uh, mm-hmm. So the uh, so anyway, there's a. A guy with a crossbow, and his one arm is wounded grievously. He goes to a convent, <laughs> and he's like, I'm from uh-huh. a village, and Voltan destroyed it. They were laughing, and they amputate his hand. A convent that is a very cool map painting. I think we can all agree, right? It, oh, is. Sure. it was pretty cool, yeah. yeah. And this man is Ranolf, and for a while you'd be mistaken in thinking that, that he's the hero of the movie because it takes a long time for Hawk to come back. For a while, mm-hmm. this is the adventures of Ranolf looking for Hawk. Uh, Which, by the way, better actor. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. Well, the, I wanted uh, to say earlier when Elliot was talking about the problem with Jack Palance being the brother. The other problem is, as many years older Jack Palance is, that's how much more charismatic Jack Palance also is. The hawk is kind I of mean, a blank. I mean, by the time this movie came out, Jack Palance had been in movies for roughly 40 years. Like, yeah, there's a reason he lasted that long. Because Look, he's, man, got a, not... he's got a... 
because he's super charismatic and he's got a creepy yeah. face. Uh, so, <laughs> So uh, Voltan, meanwhile, he is, his face gives him such pain that he has to go to this kind of weird, dark wizard god who talks through a, an audio-filtered uh, voice and who uses awesome. late finger lasers to cure him of his pain temporarily. And this is another moment where I was like, it's yes, awesome. movie, thank you, yes. No, it's amazing. It's like the most j- janky Lasix I've ever seen in my life. He's <laughs> screaming, and it still doesn't work. And I'm just like, what are you doing? You you put some anesthetic on there, man. Yeah. And Price they never beauty, you know? They never yeah. really explain what dimension this wizard is in or how he gets there. He'll just be talking to his men and go, "I have to go. My face is in pain." And then he's suddenly in this kind of red dimension where this wizard hangs out waiting to shoot lasers into his face from his fingers. Mm-hmm. It's oh, uh, it's so uh the, but the the it wizard It reminds me of like a sound bass person in Silver Lake. You know what I'm saying? It's like the, I totally unaccredited. He he has this belief that it's going to fix him, and that belief and cash a cash money payment is going to really cure him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's like, well, I could go with what Western medicine says with a lot of quotes <laughs> around it, but I think mm-hmm. the harmonics are what's really going to take the infection out of my face. Uh, so this, this dark – I was calling him a dark god, but later they refer to him as a wizard. Uh, he's like, you have to go to this convent uh, and do something to lure Hawk out. Uh, so Voltan and his son, whose name is Drogo – uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> they 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 go to a, although later on it's revealed that he's his, his adopted son. Uh, they go to this convent and he and his son kidnap the head nun for a ransom. And they say we're going to ransom this. And then just to make it su- make the threat super clear, Voltan cuts a loaf of bread in half with his sword, which gets its own shot. Which was it's, a chiab- <laughs> it's my favorite shot. It's a chiabata. You know, like it's one of those like oh. it's a very it's a, either a hamburger bun, a large hamburger. It's like you know what it is. It's a Schlotsky's bun. Have yeah, you heard of Schlotsky's? Yeah. 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 So that's usually... actually that's actually the kind of roll that we're <laughs> using for our sandwiches at my bar Hinterlands, which is now open for to go service. Oh, I'm so sorry. interesting and delicious. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, wow. Stuart. You have to Sponsored by. You have to buy a jumbo jumbotron for that kind of uh, business message. <laughs> Why? I'm just talking. Listen, if you cu- if you cut it with your broadsword like that, I'm there. I need I'm, to see a broadsword cut, and I'll take that away. I mean, I have to assume it's free if the customer will chop it in half with a broadsword, right, Stu? No, that's uh, kind of like a gyokaku. You know, you gotta you gotta cook your own you gotta cook your own beef, and then at this um, place you gotta cut your own ciabatta with a uh, broadsword. Not a fan of those. I'll, I'll, I'll hold the ciabatta, and then you'll carefully cut it in half using your broadsword. Uh, I don't know. If, maybe you should it just want to put it on table. It will probably require rolling a critical hit. Probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> now, what what kind of armor class is on that? He's on, on the that bread sandwich. Dude. Shibata has a five, five, or maybe a, but it has a very good saving throw, dexterity saving throw. It's a real, it's a real yeah. bouncy Shibata. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the, so Ranolf, the crossbow guy, he reports to the uh, to the abbot. Uh, and the abbot, he's like, "Hey, this nun, I was at. I happen to be at this convent, and this and the head nun got kidnapped. What do I do? I'm just a, a guy with one hand and a cro- and a magic machine crossbow." And the abbot <laughs> says, "Get Hawk. He's done work for us before." And that that sequence, I remember because the abbot was on fire the whole time. Like they shot him in a way that there was a fire underneath him the whole yeah. time, so he looked like yep. he was literally standing in a fire the whole time, which yep. looked uncomfortable. And he's like. You need to find this one man, and his name is Hawk. Hawk. And then that's when I raise mm-hmm. my fist in the air. I put down the Warhammer miniatures I was painting, and I put my <laughs> fists in the air and started chanting Hawk over and over. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hawk, Hawk, Hawk. Just like in the Mighty Ducks, but Hawk <laughs> instead of Quack. Uh, I will mention yeah. that the, the High Abbot uh, is played by the actor Harry Andrews, who was in a very great movie called The Hill with Sean Connery, so it's a much better movie than this. Uh, hmm. But this is a this is pretty fun. It's less fun than this, but it's better. Anyway, There's some uh, great British character actors that show up, and I hope we highlight oh, them as they Oh, we will. We, when the innkeeper showed up, and I was like, I know that innkeeper. Uh, yeah. We'll get to him for sure. And speaking of great British actors that we're going to highlight, Hawk is riding through the woods for a while. It's not time for the main adventure, time for a little introductory quest. A woman is about to be burned by two brigands at the stake as a witch. And this is something Hawk does a lot, which is ride through the woods until he comes across an injustice and then kill all the bad guys. Uh, and he, man- they, he they has- murder a lot of people for good, being good guys, quote unquote. unquote. There's oh, a lot yeah. of murder. It's, it's, it's yeah. tons of murder. And something that I wasn't ready for, but which I found kind of refreshing, was how stern and humorless Hawk is. I'm so used to, like, your Chris Pratt or, like, um, you know, Robert Downey Jr. type heroes in these big movies now these days. To have a hero who is so incredibly humorless and just is like, mm-hmm. yes, well, 
Stop that, or I'll kill you. Okay, killing you now. Hmm, we're not paying the ransom. It wouldn't be yeah. worth it. Voltan must die. It was like, wow, this guy's not even trying to entertain. Especially yeah. considering he has that cool, like, Han Solo kind of vest that he wears around. That, uh... and, and guys, do you think do you think I'd look cool if I had a Hawk the Slayer haircut? <laughs> oh, boy. It's like, it was like a, a bowl was put on the front to uh-huh. get the bangs, and yep. then... It's a it's a party in the back. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Yep. A hawk party. Well, when I when I go yeah when I go to my stylist I'll say okay, first put a bowl on my head, now push <laughs> it back a little bit. Yeah, it needs to be a super high bang line. Like, ugh. no, take the soup out first. Mm-hmm. Or or don't if that's the secret. Mm-hmm. To, to what? To, to <laughs> style hair. It. Yeah, to soft silky hair is minestrone. <laughs> uh, so he's gonna say there's a long stare down. Very long stare down. That's where that spaghetti western aspect comes in between Hawk and this bad guy. Then there's a sword fight, and he saves this witch. This witch is played by Patricia Quinn. That's right, from I Claudius. Did I interview her on the Max Fun podcast I Podius? Yes, I did. So that's another wow. little connection. I, I Claudius is Patricia Quinn playing here the blind uh-huh. witch who can see all and has magic hula hoops later and, in. So that's I Podius, hosted by me and John Hatchman. On Maximum Fun. I potty wow. wherever podcasts are sold. A lot of unpaid for advertisements here. <laughs> hey, um, which who was she in I, Claudius? She was Lavilla. She was the uh, she was the one she... who was in love with Sejanus, Patrick Stewart's character, and uh-huh. uh, and and goes goes crazy with evil, uh, and is gets her comeuppance. But uh-huh. she's really great in it. Just like uh, when she was Magenta in Rocky Horror Picture Show, right? Yes, I guess most people would know her as Magenta in Rocky Horror Picture Show, sure. Yeah. But uh, but I don't have a podcast to promote off of that. Whereas <laughs> she did play next year. La Villa, where I interviewed her. Uh, so the witch is like, hey, someone's looking for you. Uh, I know these things because I'm, cause I'm a, even though I told those guys I'm not a witch and I was just trying to cure their pig, I am actually a witch. Uh, he rides through the woods for a while, past a lot of bones. There's a lot of half dissolves, like said. And finally, Ranulf is had had has had a run in with some brigands and they're about to mm-hmm. kill him with a hatchet throwing it's competition. Lousy, it's lousy with brigands around these parts, right? <laughs> it was a dark time where the woods were full of brigands and there were no towns or villages. Later on they go to a blacksmith who just seems to have a stall in the middle of the woods. In the middle of the woods, yeah. Uh-huh. I think they shot in one half acre and they just kind of <laughs> twirled the camera around, twirled it around. They were it's like, the sort of thing where you like you you toggle onto your map and then you're like, I guess I'll put a fucking waypoint out here. It's not <laughs> near a town. Yeah. Can I fast travel off of that bone? So, so what? What? Le- well, I guess I'll I'll check in on Foursquare at tree with bone next to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the business now. He saves Randolph, and Randolph is like, Oh, you're Hawk. I've been looking for you. I've got a mission for you. Meanwhile. Uh, Voltan is terrorizing a bunch of people. I think this is the scene where uh, his son calls a guy a dork, which I thought was <laughs> hilarious. For, for a amazing. Fans. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is, they're, they're uh, angering some guys uh, at an inn, and the innkeeper, I was like, I know that guy. And I looked it up, and that's the actor Roy Kinnear, best known as Veruca Salt's dad from Willy Wonka yeah. and the Chocolate Factory. Oh, wow. That's where I recognize it from. I yeah. recognize a lot of these people, but I didn't really know. They're those kind of kind of character actors. You're like, oh, I saw that face, but I don't really know what their name is. Yeah, that yeah, is. He, he was in a lot of stuff, but that's that's the thing I've known best from certainly. Yeah, I was gonna say that's definitely the the big one people, especially of our age, would know him from. But he also was uh, in Help, uh, the Beatles film. Yeah. So. Now, would you call that the Beatles' best film? Uh, no, I would not. But it's pretty good. You okay, know, it good is try. overshadowed. I mean, it is- it is it's overshadowed by racist. the fact that A Hard Day's Night is a masterpiece, but Help yeah. has a lot of funny stuff in it. Help is fairly racist, as I learned when I was rewatching it with Sammy recently. Oh, yeah. I was like, I was like, oh, there's a lot of English people playing Indian assassins in this. But uh, <laughs> that's you know. true. Although it does have Leo McKern, TV's Rumple, in it, which uh, is is wonderful. Mm, I know so. him best as Number Two from The Prisoner, <laughs> okay, but, uh, or one of many Number Twos. But uh, anyway, so so Voltan really terrorizes Veruca Salt's dad, and they kill some people. And Voltan, it's unclear what his power is. He se- at first he seems to be kind of like the Dark Lord who rules over this land, but other times he has to keep introducing himself to strangers and threatening them to like get them to respect him. So it's there he's yeah. there two people eating, and Drogo is like, "Stop eating and stand." When Voltan is here, and they're like, "Who? I'm eating right now." <laughs> and we, I hate and, when that happens. They mention that they're slavers, and it'll come in later. So that's good foreshadowing. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we have a flashback to Hawk's wedding day. Uh, well, this looks like a Duke com- douche commercial. Like, <laughs> yes. Full-on douche commercial. It's uh-huh. white. 
There's like yep. this very badly makeup. The woman has the worst makeup I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. It's like a child got like a, an 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 eye eyeshadow palette and just smeared it on her face. Uh -huh. It's really bad. I feel bad for this actress. Uh, that actress is Catriona McCall, who uh, was in a bunch of like Lucio Fulci movies. She was in a lot of Italian horror movies. Uh, oh, cool. And so, but it's she doesn't get much to do here, uh, other than to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it professed her undying love to Hawk, although apparently she used to be Voltan's girlfriend. I and this love is... it so much. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, oh, we're just friends, dude. <laughs> yeah, she totally yeah. friend zones Voltan in this scene. And it's like, I just married your brother. <laughs> He's complaining that while he was at war, his younger brother was, uh, you know, like using his silver tongue. But I'm like, I don't know, dude, you're really old and look like a skeleton. <laughs> it's like, I, I wanted Hawk to be like, wait, you mean your daughter, right? <laughs> like I'm marrying your daughter, but uh, the I mean, they, so uh, Hot Voltan is like, hey, that sh uh, Lady Eliane was supposed to be mine, and it's weird to bring that up on the wedding day. You'd think he'd bring it up before the actual day of the wedding. Uh, yeah. She uh, Voltan runs off after saying she should be his, and she gives Hawk a little charm for protection, which is a kind of like what Celtic cross almost. Mm -hmm. And we'll find but it does come into play later. Mm -hmm. It is like somebody did some work on the screenplay because it's like, oh, that plays in later, much later. Oh, yeah. It does. Everything they plant has a payoff, mostly. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> uh, they travel through. Uh, anyway, uh, Hawk and and uh, and Ranolf, they go. He's like, we're going to have to travel through the haunted forest of Weir to get my compatriots for our for our fighting party. Uh, and it's fine. It's just like. It's like they're they're riding on horseback through like a haunted house forest because like little mup. There's puppet a little mole toad that looks like out. Baby Yoda did a lot of meth and it just keeps mm -hmm. popping up and as a puppet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like they cut to this little Baby Yoda <laughs> meth kid yep. and then they're then they're out of it. It takes like it takes like five seconds for them to go to this haunt th through this haunted house woods, which I love more than anything. <laughs> it really he, mm -hmm. the build up for the haunted house woods. I take they takes. Uh, almost as much time as the actual haunted housewoods. Yep. And they never get off their horses, and it's it's almost nope. he's like, I hope you're not afraid of being looked at by a gross puppet, because <laughs> that's what we're about to experience. <laughs> There's only one puppet, but we're gonna show it a lot of times in different <laughs> parts of the woods. Yep. And uh, they at the when they're out of the forest, they're back to the witch. Uh, kind of, I don't know why they had to take so much time to get to her, uh, and she takes them to her magic cave where she's gonna transport. Uh, Hawk to get each of the members of his uh, fighting party, his old buddies. Now, how, which of you guys wants to describe her method of teleportation, what it looks like and how it works? Is that the two spinning uh, hula hoops? Yes. Mm -hmm. it magic is that... hula hoop magic. Yeah, they're, is... they're, they're, they're spinning sort of like, imagine like one hula hoop when it stops spinning like on the ground and is kind of like like going around on its uh, on its edges, sort of gyroscope style. Like now, put two of them together. To, uh, and then on make top it like other. neon colors because yeah. that's completely appropriate for yeah. well, medieval. I think, I think kind neon of cool. is the color palette of magic in this movie, as you'll see, yes. like in, yes. the, in mm -hmm. the big climax. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, magic looks the, a lot like stormtrooper uh, lasers in this movie. <laughs> Or, or alternate looks like someone is throwing glowing bouncy balls through a door yes. <laughs> from off camera. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's the the hula hoop magic. The hula hoop magic looks like like a an exam. An, like if you had a science museum for kids, where they're like inertia can keep this hula hoop standing up as as long as it's moving. That's what it reminded me of. Okay, so uh, she sends him individually to get each of the three members of the party. There is Gort, a giant, uh, who's uh -huh. pretty tall, I guess. He's not like and that's giant giant. And he's played by the guy who played the Cyclops in Crawl. Is it the same guy? Oh, yep. wow. Yep. That guy's been in some awesome stuff. Yep. And uh, so he is, and we, we meet him as he is fixing a, a merchant's wagon, and then the merchant won't pay him, so he breaks the merchant's wagon wheel again. Uh, and he carries a big hammer that I think is supposed to look heavy, but it's, you know, it's very clearly made out of a very light, balsa e material uh <laughs> and hawk shows up and is like hey come with me we got an adventure and they and he wait but he kills a bunch of people too the giant right yeah there's a lot of just murder and it's like let's go be good guys like it's just <laughs> yeah. sequence after sequence just civilians and brigands who are mildly maybe chaotic neutral uh -huh. but they're dead <laughs> they die yeah, yeah there's a feeling of like after after a couple situations you're like i think you're looking for fights guys like i think you're trying <laughs> yeah. to make this happen <laughs> Yeah, this they're not they're certainly not de-escalating. 
That's for sure. <laughs> nope. Uh, there's, a, a, there's a point where Voltan is kind of the lesser of two evils. Where you're like, okay, I mm-hmm. guess Hawk is mildly better. But uh, then he goes to my favorite member of the group. That's right. It's Crow, which Wikipedia describes as a reticent elf. So reticent. <laughs> uh, uh, he wears kind of like a stitched together leather red hoodie. And, it looks like, like pepperoni, or maybe <laughs> the inside of a skinned human. I can't tell. It's the most repulsive texture on mm-hmm. his on his armor, and I just love it. I love it, and he is my favorite character ever. He yeah. is so. They're, they're clearly going for a like last of his kind, uh, brooding figure. But mainly, uh-huh. what he does, he sits there and he examines arrow points he's just had made for a long time. He's challenged to an archery contest, which duh, he wins. But he's just he's a super fast bowman. Hanging out at the forest blacksmith, uh, just lo- he's like the kid who hangs up at, at the skate shop, just looking now, at the new boards. Is that yeah. is that more of a blacksmith or a guy who makes bows? That's you're what, right. Like he's a, probably a, a Fletcher, a bowyer, a boat. No, a Fletcher makes arrows. But he's making a, arrows. He's giving. He's, he's making, making oh, okay. arrows. He's making yeah. arrows. But somebody and makes now, bows is what a bowyer, a, bo- a bowyer, a, a Chadwick a Boseman. And this Chadwick Boseman. this yeah. raises a good point, which is: Did Jessica Fletcher make? Arrows. Mm-hmm. Very good question. And yes, that's what she murdered people with. And okay. then she'd write about it. Yeah. All right. Now that's I, I knew I worked with someone once and they had two children named uh Piper and Cooper, and they were having a third child, and I so wanted them to name them Fletcher, so their older all their children would be named after medieval tradecraft, but <laughs> they did not. Disappointed. Wheelwright. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That famous surname, Wheelwright. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he wins this archery contest. Uh, nobody, I think, is... Oh, no, one person is killed. Uh, and yep. and yeah. Hawk comes by, and it, they, he, they're trying to hustle this elf, and it's like, dude, don't Love try it. to hustle an elf wearing a pepperoni hoodie for in an <laughs> archery contest. <laughs> like, that goes without saying. Yep. <laughs> the minute he pulls back his hood and you see his elf ears, you should be like, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I don't, I don't want yeah. to tar- trouble you. Just like Vizzini said, that's one of the classic plunders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the final member of the group is Baldin, a jokey dwarf, who we see who's, he's about to be sacrificed in a Viking funeral pyre uh, by, by this... By Hare Krishnas, yeah, right? Yeah, by this kind of Hare yes. Krishna cult. And uh, yeah. he gets saved. His his special ability is he has a whip, which he used, does not use to save himself. Hawk saves him. Instead, he whips a fish out of the river and then eats it whole, just sticks it in his eats mouth. Eats it whole. He eats all... I mean, it's really the sexiest thing I've ever seen in actor <laughs> do. This, this dwarf... <laughs> <laughs> actor whip the water take a whole cod or whatever trout and just like blah, blah, like a dolphin eat it yeah. i was just like wow there's no <laughs> point at which in this movie i can calm down because i'm always surprised yeah. by something that happens oh yeah it's yeah. you have to be like so does he have his teeth in his throat like what's going on uh-huh. or is it like when heathcliff would take a whole fish and yeah. put it in his mouth uh-huh. and pull the bones out he was like yeah. in his audition they're like uh, I see that you can't. You didn't list stage combat. Do you have any other skills that might be useful for this role? And he's like, "Funny you should ask." He's like, and he pulls you may see that out. I I brought a cooler with me today. <laughs> <laughs> um, the five heroes they've been assembled. They're all uh, that uh, Patricia Quinn got them all together, and she's like. Well, they only paid me for so much time in this movie. I'll be back later. Time for you to go to the convent. They go to the convent to find out what the mission is. They've got to save the head abbess. Uh, there's another flashback in which Elion dies saving Hawk from Volton. Volton throws, what, a dagger at him, and she gets in the way of it. Um, and I think he yeah. shoots her with a crossbow, actually. Oh, right. I forgot. It's all crossbows all the time. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just full crossbows. Uh, we get a scene where, a very prolonged scene, where the giant is going to eat a whole chicken. and the It's g- the longest <laughs> dialogue in the whole scene. In it's the whole the movie. Longest movie. I was like, is this still going on where the dwarf is tricking the the giant to give him his chicken, which is clearly like a Cornish hen. <laughs> yeah. And it, but it just does not end. It's like this is the fun. The, the the director thought this is the funniest scene we've ever done. We're gonna let them just riff. <laughs> <laughs> well, just people are gonna be talking for years about the dwarf tricking the giant out of his chicken. The chicken trick scene. The famous Hawk the Slayer chicken trick mm-hmm. scene. And it goes on for a long time. But luckily, the dwarf manages to pull it off, and he does eat that chicken, and he eats it. With just as much grace and elegance as he ate that fish earlier. <laughs> um, just shoving it into his face and hoping some of the meat gets to his mouth. Um, they're like, okay, they, Voltan asked for a ransom. Where are we going to get the money for this ransom? And the, there's a nun there who does not like Hawk and his pals. He knows, she knows that they're trouble. Maybe word got to her about how many people they murdered on the way to the convent. Yeah. But they're like, we got to get some money. And you know what? 
maybe we'll cause some trouble at the same time. So they go to the river where the slavers are and uh, kill all these people and free their slaves, which is a bunch of guys in, like, very surprisingly skimpy loincloths. Um, And for no reason at all, they set up, the giant sets up, like, a torture trap for one of the guys. <laughs> I was like, who is the bad guy here? They murdered 30 people here. Mm-hmm. They let the slavers go and then they put like a flail over this bad guy's face and then his head gets crushed in and then they do like a quip and I'm like, are these, do I like these people? Not really. <laughs> no, no, they're tough guys but it was a tough time again. This is a tough time when yeah. Voltan was was ruling the airwaves and everybody was, <laughs> everybody was doing the hawk. Uh, I do like, I do like that the lead slaver guy who were introduced to like spilling food out of his mouth. Uh, I like that even at the at the end, even when he's face to face with a giant, he's like, I think I could still win. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he has a lot of pluck, that slaver. <laughs> yeah. oh, so I I took, only I'm now looking up, because I, I forgot to look this up earlier. So the man who plays Hawk and Voltan's father, uh, the actor Ferdy Main, he was three years older than Jack Palance. So I was wrong oh, earlier <laughs> when I said Jack Palance you, looked older. He's not the oldest person in the movie. Yeah. No, no, um, yeah, when he was three, he had a child. And that child was Jack Palance. And he was in now, a surprising number of actors in this movie were in Barry Lyndon. I guess because there's a lot of English actors in Barry Lyndon. Have we reached the point also, I'm sorry, I, uh, where um, the actor who played uh, Hercule in, um, in A Shot in the Dark is in the movie? Uh, I don't as, remember. Who'd... As an older man. Yeah. Uh, the guy, apparently this actor, I looked him up after that. the facts. Like the guy who played Hercule was actually in more Pink Panther movies than Peter Sellers because he was in one of the posthumous Pink Panther films. He was a friend of Peter Sellers from the old days and he was in makeup for a lot of the other... Like, he's the the innkeeper who's like uh, the does your dog bite scene. Oh, uh, okay. So right. uh, he's also in this movie. I can't remember as whom, though. And I think a few of these actors were in episodes of Doctor Who. Oh, oh yeah. So, <laughs> so you're, ta- you're talking about uh, Graham Stark. Yes. Who played Hercule. So he's, yeah, he plays uh, a character named Wait. Sparrow, who I don't remember who that is in the movie. Uh, but yeah, he's, uh, that's right. I, you know what? I didn't recognize him. And I should have, because I love those movies. All right, okay. But that's besides the point. I can't feel too bad about it, because they've got their money. They, they, are, they killed a bunch of people, but Voltan's son Drogo, his blood is up. He's like, I want to go on more raids. I want to go leave. I should be mm-hmm. doing stuff instead of just hanging out in this tent with you, my dad, Voltan, and this nun you're keeping in a cage in the corner of your tent. Very strange. Like, it's like a big dog carrier cage. Uh, yeah. And Voltan threatens him, and I can't remember exactly why he threatened him. He's just irritated that his, mm-hmm. that his son was just... Talking I don't know. I just was I was distracted because it looked like anthropology. He really decorated the interior of that tent with the anthropology. Yeah. Even the cage looks like anthropology chic. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I kind of <laughs> like that scene. Very flowy. A lot of a lot of flowy kind of like a lot of bold patterns. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he she and the nun is like you know I can cure your face. At this point, I was like oh his face was the problem because he's cover he's got this helmet that covers most of his face and it at, with the first time you see that wizard shooting lasers at him it's not really that clear what he's doing he's helping him in some yeah. way but uh he, she, he goes it's impossible i've tried it can only i can only have the pain taken away and that only temporarily and then voltan's son is like what hawk stopped all those slavers hold on I've got a plan. Cut to Voltan just getting lasers shot into his face by that wizard's fingers. Like it's, and every time Voltan is like, ah, like it clearly hurts him to have the treatment. So I don't know. Maybe he should have had the nun try it. I do. Uh, the, I do the same thing every time I go to the gym. You know. Yeah. Screaming. Uh, mm-hmm. Just screaming. Uh, Hawk and his dudes plan what they're gonna do. Uh, they are not going to pay the ransom, that's for sure, because they're like, if we pay the ransom, then Voltan's just going to kill the nun anyway, so we might as well just not do it and make Voltan come here. And the nuns are like, can you please save our abbess, which I think was the quest <laughs> that you were given, and Hawk And why is did so... you kill all those slavers to get all the money when you're not even going to do anything with the money? Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, that's a very good point. And Hawk, at this point, it's clear that his larger mission is to stop Voltan. He doesn't really care I just, who he hurts the And the, the only process. thing I remember is that every time you go to the, the, the inn, it looks like there, it's like some kind of like open just trough of food. There was like a huge thing of small chickens and celery. <laughs> like, it doesn't feel like, you know, a place of worship. It just feels like kind of a bad, you know, restaurant because there's yeah. just tables there the whole time. Yeah, yeah like a dining hall. I don't know where the nuns like say prayers unless it's during meals. 
since yeah, it just seems to be a place that nuns serve. I mean, if barely serve food. Yeah, if you were nuns who were trying to keep the place you say prayers, I don't know, separate from where the murderers are, I would probably just keep them corralled near the food trough. That's a good point. They're not going to ask a lot of questions. Speaking of food, uh, the dwarf tricks the giant with food talk again. Uh, and I can't remember if this is where he tricks him out of food or he tricks him into not eating his mixed nuts in a bag that he keeps. Maybe that's later. This is uh, there's this is the running gag throughout is that the is that our uh, is that Balden is constantly tricking Gort out of his food. The bad guys they finally attack the convent. Drogo goes to get the ransom and he steals it. The good guys end up killing most of the bad guys, but the nuns are real unhappy. They're like, "That was not helpful. Why are you doing this?" Uh, she is not happy what's going on. Drogo goes back to Voltan and dies in Voltan's arms. And Voltan is so sad that he orders his henchmen to fight him so that he can kill them as kind of like a sacrifice to Drogo's honor. It's very strange. And his henchmen are looking make at any sense. <laughs> and his henchmen are looking at each other like, Is this was this part of the job when I started? Hold on a second. Like it's do toxic, we have to do toxic this? Toxic masculinity, guys. That's it's it insidious. Really is. Well, nobody nobody stopped Voltan when they could when he first started this behavior, and now he thinks he can get away with anything, you know? Yeah, and it's, it's just not fair. And he talks later about how, like, no women would be with me, and it's like, dude, maybe that's your fault. Maybe that's yeah. maybe that's not on anyone but you. Maybe but, it's not your weird pussy eye, okay? <laughs> it's your behavior. Like, it's the Middle Ages. Have you seen the other people in this movie? It is not... <laughs> It is not a fleet of dreamboats. I think you could, if you had worked on your personality, I think you could have made it work with somebody. Uh, Voltan goes, he rides up to the convent and announces to the nuns, I'll be back tomorrow. And when I come back tomorrow with my men, you better give me Hawk and the gold or else. Which begs the question, why didn't he just do it then? Why did yeah. he give them a day to like plan? And why did he show up by himself? I, maybe he was just, he just wasn't thinking rationally. He's so sad that his, that his yeah. son got killed. Uh, the heroes decide they're going to go on the offensive somewhat because uh, the witch, Patricia Quinn, she sends them, she teleports them to Voltan's like henchman camp and they just, with magic smoke to, to cloud slaughter. the moments, and they just slaughter, slaughter. people. It's, and this yeah. is when you get the most repeating crossbow bolt moments and the most repeating crow arrow bolt moments where they're literally just showing you the same shot cut together real fast, both crossbows and crow with his bone arrow, and it's amazing. Yeah, it's great. But it's there's so much smoke, and the only thing you can see is the end of Hawk's sword, which makes him the best target to kill. <laughs> you can see that glowing green mm -hmm. sword, but then it's okay because the two guys who have the arrows and the crossbows will just mow down everybody anyway, so who cares? And they never need to load either of these. Like, you never see Crow cocking an arrow, or no knocking back an arrow, and you never <laughs> see... He's so uh, fast. He's and so you fast, never see dude. the other no. guy cocking his crossbow. It's just unlimited shots. It's it's amazing. Uh -huh. It's like, uh, like uh, the what is it, the roach in uh, the Punisher roach in the Cerebus comics? <laughs> He's got, like, twin twin crossbow bolt guns. I did not get that far into Cerebus, I have to admit. Okay. So I'm going to take Well, I, I don't think it's it. now is the time to pick it <laughs> <Yeah>. up. <laughs> no, no. I, think, I mean, I've, I've been hearing so many great things about it. Uh, <laughs> you can stop after, what is it, High Society, Church of State, whatever one's later. <laughs> mm. uh, so there's that mist. They go, oh, the smoke is clearing. We've got to leave. But it's like, you guys are doing great. Like, you're destroying everybody. I don't. Why don't you just finish the job now? You're at yeah, Bolton's yeah. camp. I don't. Anyway, they're like, the no, we got to go. We got to go back and save our game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Hawk and company, they go back to uh, the convent. Yeah, to maybe for, maybe yeah. they burn through all their like single use abilities for the day mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they need yeah, to recharge. Yeah, they're like, we need them. to redo our spells. <laughs> yeah. mm. You're That's saying they're taking a short rest. Is that what? what? Oh, look at Dan. Look at this yeah, guy. I, you forced Fucking me. You forced Master me, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's what, like, this movie. I'll just end before we finish the film. Like it does feel to me like you made a Dungeons and Dragons movie in so many ways. There's mm -hmm. so much traveling. There's so much mm -hmm. like assembling and people like figuring out what their abilities are. There's a lot of like yeah, resting, like attacking, and then being like, well, uh, the rules say we got to stop now, so let's go. I mean, it, this is totally a filmed LARP. <laughs> this is one hundred percent. To for better uh, and worse. Now, yeah. how would now tell me why for better and tell me why for worse? But say it mm -hmm. like the comic strip for better or worse. <laughs> um, oh God! Uh, something about Barkley? Is he a dog? <laughs> uh, probably with a name like Barkley, unless it's Charles oh. Barkley. Or am I thinking about the dog from Sesame Street? Or were they both Barkley? 
Anyway, have I distracted they might both you be enough? Barclay. <laughs> uh, yeah, possibly. I still want an answer, but I guess I don't need it anymore. Uh, no. But you're right. I hadn't even thought about that. It is like it is a LARP movie. Uh, the, what was the? Why am I forgetting it? The name of that documentary about the LARPing group, like Dalcon or something like that. It's like yeah. you're watching their game. Anyway, uh, the nun who does not approve of Hawk and his fellows refusing to free the abbess and instead just murdering people left and right. She goes to Voltan and helps him get the drop on Hawk. Uh-oh. Voltan sneaks in with all his men. Well, first she poisons the giant and everyone else that they with a mm-hmm. sleeping draught. Go sleepy. They all mm-hmm. go real sleepy. And when they woke up, when they, when they wake up, not woke up. I mean, woke up because it's in the past tense. It happened already. Yeah. But let's say wake up. Uh, Voltan's got his sword at their necks and they got the drop on him. And Voltan, I think then kills that nun. Or does he just punch yeah, her? Yeah, he kills her. He just no, stabs he kills her. He kills her, her I later, I think, right? I, no, I thought he killed her like right no, in front of there. Like, right. oh, you won't be able to see it. And then she, he like kills her. And like, everyone's like, no, oh, you didn't. Yeah. Like <laughs> even, his, even his henchmen are like, whoa, over the line, boss. Yeah, and they're like, before when you challenged our friends to a fight to the death, we thought you were a little <laughs> weird. <laughs> uh, but it's there's a couple nuns who look alike. And so I, I thought he killed her. And then later on, another nun showed up. And I was like, wait, but is that the same? I don't know. Mm-hmm. But... uh. The, but I think he does. The he goes. Then he's he. Uh, Voltan taunts them for a while, and then the dwarf taunts him back, and he stabs the dwarf who's tied up. Even the nun wasn't tied up. She could have conceivably yeah. batted the knife out of his hands. Uh, and Voltan's like, "Oh, this has made me so mad. I need some more magic face treatment." Goes to get some lasers in the face, uh, and the witch uses her magic. This is my favorite movie. Favorite play- thing in the movie. There's three or four favorite things in the movie. The hula hoops. <laughs> The fish eating, but it, when the witch goes into the convent and attacks a guy with silly string, yeah. mm-hmm. and he is incapacitated and wrapped up with silly string, like literal silly string, I think I've laughed harder than yeah. any comedy I've ever watched. She, she holds up yeah. her staff and just shoots silly string out of it, and it's it's another one of those moments where you're like, now is when you're doing that? Yeah. Like... Like why not? Yeah, she 10 like sticks ago. the little. She sticks her little wand, which kind of looks like a little blowgun, through the crack in the door. And the guard, like, there's a couple shots of the guard, like, eyeballing it and being like, "The fuck!" and like approaching it slowly. And you're like, <laughs> "Dude, I know it's gonna happen, but I didn't know it was so much crazier." <laughs> yeah, it is a lot of silly string. It's not the regular amount. No, like, no, it's like the uh, like literally a cocoon of silly yeah. string. <laughs> It would incapacitate me, the silly string. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> oh wow! Wow, I, yeah, and you're you're the hardiest of all of us mm-hmm. when it comes to silly string the, resistance. I'm yeah, dead. you really have the best saving. Throw now, on that one. Dan, what's interesting is that in this scenario, you are projecting yourself as one of Voltan's guards, uh, which <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that I you was... see yourself in that position. Whereas I would be I more like was... one of Hawk's men, who are not great, but you know identifying myself so much as just expressing that you know, like this this guard. Who probably got fired for 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 all of this? Uh, oh, he's know. dead, Dan. He's dead. Oh, what? He got fired from life. There's, there's what? No... He's dead. He's dead. He did. He was suffocated by that silly strain. Yeah. Oh, I gotta text some people. <laughs> oh wow. Because because when I was watching it, I was it like, feels yeah, performative. I... You didn't even know him that well. Yeah. yeah. I was. I when I was watching that scene, I was like, yeah, I'd be the kind of witch that shoots silly string out of a staff at people. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what I'd do, and I'd have neon hula hoops. Uh, the uh, the dwarf Baldin unfortunately dies. Even her magic is not enough to save him. But he he as he says he dies the way he wished, surrounded by his friends. Uh, oh. And they make a little grave for him, a, a little grave because he's short. Uh, the witch then it's another moment where she's like, okay, I'm going to help you. I'm going to it's something about I'm going to blind them with a with a hail of magic or something like that, of lightning. But what actually comes out is kind of a whirlpool of fake snow and glowing bouncy <laughs> balls that are just bursting through the door it's of the amazing. convent at she's the bed. She's the best thing in the movie. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, and she is like, she's I I'm a I'm a big fan of her performance in this. Like, she has just the right amount of like mysteriousness. She's the only one. She's the only one that has any dignity whatsoever in yeah. the movie. Mm-hmm. And she has the best shots. So there'll be scenes where like she's in the extreme foreground in profile, yeah. and she's talking mm-hmm. to people who are in the background face the camera. It's very Ingmar Bergman-y. Uh, it's it's almost like she was like, you're gonna have to do better when I'm on screen. Like, come on. Uh, the bad guys are all blinded, I guess, by this hail of what you could buy. Yeah. I mean, now I'm realizing a lot of her magic is just stuff you could buy in the gift shop of like a science center, or like or Spencer's. Yeah, or Spencer's. Yeah, it's just like glowing balls, glowing hula hoops, silly string. Well, 
Elliot, to the to the uninitiated, that sort of thing might seem like magic. <laughs> okay, thank you, so, Arthur C. Clarke. <laughs> you're, you're paraphrasing Arthur C. Clarke's famous dictum that to to a lower civilization, novelty gifts would appear to be magic. <laughs> she's she's just throwing like uh, like aprons with naked ladies painted on them at them, and so. <laughs> Trying to think yep. what other Could, stuff you could buy at Spencer's tri- tricking, gifts. Trick, tricking, tricking people into thinking that a uh, that cart actually has a pair of testicles hanging behind <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, so uh, she, they're they're all fighting. Uh, Voltan uh, takes the giant and the, and the nuns, of which there are now three. I guess that's all there ever were. A uh, prisoner <laughs> and is like, Hawk, give yourself up, or I'll kill them. And he's got some elaborate trap. And Hawk is like, okay, that's all I'm going to do. He goes, put your sword down. Now take off your vestments. I don't know why. He has to remove his vestments, but he does. And he's like, uh, well, if you'd like to pray, now's the time before I kill you. And he kneels down and he holds that cross pendant that Ilian gave him when she was, when she, like, on their wedding day. And what is revealed inside of it? A little tiny dagger. Yep. It's like a little <laughs> switchblade cross, which begs the question, why did his fiance have that? Uh, <laughs> Just for cocaine. Oh, yeah. okay. Just, just for cutting up lines. Uh, now he, now this is where I have to admit I was doing the dishes and I took my eye away. So how did he use that dagger cross to to save the day? He threw it right, and then he got his sword. Yeah. Then he pulled his sword across the room, and he's like, "You have the power of the mind." And then I, I wasn't paying attention. At I think this he, point. I, I just... think he threw it, and it cut the bonds on Gort the giant, who started mm-hmm. bashing dudes. Then he called, uh, he called. Then the he mind called his sword, sword yeah. and then it's like, "You have the power of the mind." And Voltan was, "That's mine." And then they start doing something, and then blah blah blah. It's amazing mm-hmm. that at that moment is when Voltan realizes that, that. Hawk has the Mindstone sword, which he's been using all movie. He's been, and he has it. He's on the back. Like, why is this a revelation? Also, yeah. you, he left it in the first scene. He's, it was right there. Yeah, yeah, he could have taken it. It's also, you'd have to assume it's part yeah. of the legend of Hawk. At one point, someone's like, huh, word will get around that someone is looking for Hawk when they tell Ranolf that. So that, and it's like, well, if that kind of word travels, then you'd think the fact that the guy has a glowing sword with a hand on the end of it would also get around, but. I guess not. It's kind of like the old Teen Wolf problem of how do these other high schools, how have they not heard ahead of time that this one high school has a werewolf on its team? Uh Because you'd think that kind of thing would travel. You'd think at least the coaches would tell each other, watch out for this team. It's got a werewolf on it. Yeah, you would think some desperate coach would show up to a game with a pistol with a silver bullet in it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Or, or perhaps those teams just have all sign NDAs before the game. And they're like, why do we have to sign this? Don't worry about it. And afterwards they're like, oh, we wish we could tell people that we lost to a werewolf. Uh, can't. Can't break the NDA. You don't want the werewolf to sue you. I like Stewart's version, though, where they, this, this coach shoots Michael J. Fox and then everyone's yeah. horrified. He's like, what? He was a werewolf. Yeah. Do you yeah. not see it? We were yeah, all yeah. here. <laughs> Yeah, like a real strung out basketball coach like Ben <laughs> Affleck in that new movie. Yeah. And he's he's like, and I also have some things to say about how you're putting on a high school play where the Confederates are the heroes, because mm-hmm. that's a larger issue, too. Boy, yeah. oh boy, Teen Wolf, you've got a lot of explaining to do. Uh, so anyway, there's a very slow motion sword fight between Voltan and Hawk, and I couldn't tell if it looked cooler in slow motion or lamer, because it's one of those things where clearly you're not going to get a fast motion sword fight from yeah, lamer, Jack lamer. Collins. It's lamer that it's in slow motion. <laughs> Uh, Very much later. Uh, surprise, Hawk wins, uh, mm-hmm. and we see we finally see Voltan's horribly scarred face as he dies. Uh, was it? Did it live up to the promise, guys? It looked like an, like a some like a butt boil. It was like a butt boil on his eye, kind of like a tomato <laughs> smashed in there. It was pretty gross, but I was just like, "Wow, you guys really need to get that looked at." Like this, mm-hmm. I mean, whatever it, natural uh, homeopathy you were getting done on this eyeball, like you need to really go to the doctor. Yeah, you like I know you like I know you like your wizard friend. <laughs> you feel bad, <laughs> but maybe you should go see an actual doctor. Maybe it's time to stop applying milkwort to it during the full moon. And just you know, talk to a talk to a dermatologist. But I, yeah. I was like, oh, that was it. He could have gotten by with that. You know, again, uh, Middle Ages. You got you got elves and stuff running around. Uh, but Voltan dies finally. He the world is saved from Voltan. Hawk and his pals leave. But uh oh, that evil wizard god. He floats into the room like an evil orco, and is like, 
Hey. He does look like Orko. He looks exactly like Orko. I he's was like, trying to remember the name of it. It literally is Orko. He floats in, and then he's like, sequel time, bitch. Yeah, he's like, we have plans for you, Dark One. We're not done with you, even though you failed completely at everything we set you up to do. But yeah, he's like evil Orko. He even sounds a little bit like Orko, and then I think of it. Yeah. He does. He yeah. does. I was. I totally forgot. Thank God you you brought that up because I was going to ask you like what what was that cartoon character? What it was? Oh, thank you. No, oh, my pleasure. Look, if 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 we could just to have you on for that moment, I appreciate. I it. can yeah. sleep now. I can sleep. I didn't sleep for two days. <laughs> I can sleep. And uh, Haw- and the giant is like, mm, I hear there are some rich barons up in the north who are paying for guardsmen. Perhaps I'll make a little gold coinage. And uh, Hawk, find they're riding together. The the Crow, the elf, has disappeared at this point. I, did he go back? I don't know where he went to. I don't know. I'm like, where did he go? I love that guy, pepperoni. <laughs> Come on. That- <laughs> I guess he's got to he's got to go get himself a new a new hoodie because that one is getting a little ripe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> just wearing it around in the forest for days on end. So Hawk and his giant friend are ri- riding along, and they see who's this in the forest? Patricia Quinn. Uh oh. Some wizards are meeting in the south for bad business. Hawk is like, mm, perhaps you should go to the south instead, Gort the giant. And the giant's like, I guess I won't be making that money after all. Ha, ha, ha. And they ride off uh, uh. to the sequel, which was never made, but which I assume would have been called Hawk, the surprise bad guy, where (laughs) it would turn out that, like, everyone suddenly realized, like, oh, Hawk is really misusing this Mind Stone sword by just Mm -hmm. slaughtering people left and right. Now, okay. Uh, I think they actually tried to kickstart a sequel, like, 10 years ago, maybe, for Hawk the Hunter. Mm. Wow. Oh. Yeah. I just feel like that seems like a downgrade for being a Slayer. Yeah. From, from Slayer? Yep. So what would yeah. be an upgrade from Slayer? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, if we're all following cube cube rules, Hyper Slayer. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's by cube <laughs> rules. I mean, yeah. uh, I guess, Stuart, in metal terms, what would be one step up from Slayer? Again, Slayer, top tier if you like that kind of sound. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. my favorite. Big four. I mean, Metallic is the next step up from Slayer, arguably. I guess so. I guess that's true. Uh, where it's like, it's slightly more uh, melodic and slightly fewer songs about Nazi war criminals. Slightly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what would you, but what would you, so, uh, so Dad's Dan's pitch for the sequel is Hawk the Hyper Slayer. Do you guys have mm-hmm. pitches lined up for the sequel? Because uh, Hawk the Face Masher. That's pretty mm-hmm. good, yeah. That's yeah, pretty, and very specific. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> uh, my real one would be Hawk the Kindergarten Cop, where now he's got to go undercover as a kid. Gotcha. So yeah. here's the story. Uh, there's a kindergarten, and guess who's the principal? Voltan. That's right. He's training these kids to be evil wizard sacrifices or something. Looks mm-hmm. like someone's got to go undercover, because Hawk can't just walk in there. Voltan will recognize him. They're brothers. And so he's got to go in as the new teacher— H. Auk, Mr. Harold Auk, uh, and you know he's teaching the kids his own brand of here's how you use a sword, here's what a Mind Stone does. One kid mm-hmm. talks about how his, his dad is a real sex machine, just like in the original movie. And mm-hmm. then, uh, I don't know, what happens at the end of Kindergarten Cop? They've got to climb up an electric tower or something like that? Uh, I don't know, yeah. Elliot. All I know is nope. we talked about getting Felicia out of here early, and you've introduced a whole new bit at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's just call it Kindergarten Hawk, and we'll deal with the details mm-hmm. later. So, Dan, what okay. do we do after we talk about the summary? I'll, I'll read the treatment. Okay. I'll read the treatment later. Okay, I'll, I'll, give you notes. I'll email okay. it to you. If I can get notes on that, that'd be great. Uh, can we at- great, great. Can we can attach you as a producer, possibly, Star? <laughs> you know what? Um, I'll have to read. The, I have to talk to my people. Okay. Uh, my people will get back to you. That's fair. Maybe. It'll be my three-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, what we do now, this is the final part of the movie portion of this movie podcast. I mean, we talk about movies later, but whatever. You know what yeah. I'm talking about. Uh, and that is where we make <laughs> our final judgments about whether this is a good, bad movie, a movie that was funny in its badness, a bad, bad movie, a movie that we just didn't like, or a movie we kind of liked. And that's, you know, self-explanatory. Uh, I think I'm the dissenting voice, so maybe I shouldn't go first. I don't know if I should go last either. Just go. Go. You okay, I will. Yeah. All right, Dan. Know. Felicia wants to get out of here. Um, here's what I would say. I This is not a uh, unique notion to me, uh, I'm sure, although I came to it on my own, so I'm going to take credit for it. Uh, like gravity? Movies, Dan, we've yeah, known about gravity. it for hundreds of years. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say, like, uh, movies are obviously about – the, the plot of the movie, but also, in a way, they are all documentaries in that they are time capsules of when they were made. 
and uh, bad movies, I feel like, are often, or low budget, let's say, movies, not bad, are doubly so because they can't afford, like, big costume designers or whatnot, stuff that might, uh, you know, people are, like, bringing stuff from home. It feels more of the time. And so on that level, I really enjoyed the movie. I liked all the silly stuff, like the glowing balls. But on the downside for me, I don't want to make it seem like I don't like fantasy. I feel like I insulted something very dear to uh, other members of, of the podcast right now. I, I I like it a lot, but it is not like the first genre that uh, appeals to me. So usually I feel like there has to be a thing specifically I connect with. Whereas this movie uh, feels like it was sort of generated by a random fantasy movie generating machine. It feels very basic in the in the plot and I don't I don't want to be too down on it because I think although fantasy literature was a was a thing before this for a while uh the sort of high fantasy um I mean only like, for centuries well I mean like <laughs> for this specific like Tolkien-esque like thing that then sort of took over a lot of fantasy mm-hmm. um like mostly existed in literature and this was one of the earliest movies really of this so i don't want to ding it too much for that but the, the the story just bored me guys i just couldn't get into that part of it but what do you guys say i i i uh, uh, i don't know Mar- marginal good bad maybe but i mostly was bored now dan it's i mean you don't have to you don't have to feel bad about not liking it just because i'm gonna say this is a movie i kind of liked uh mm-hmm. because it is but not it's not very good It's not a good movie, but I think the reasons you didn't like it are the reasons that I particularly liked it, that uh, the, it feels like the most basic template fantasy movie I can think of. Like, it really Mm -hmm. does feel like they're like, what do we have in a fantasy movie? There's a bad guy. Okay. There's a magic sword. Great. Throw it in. There's a witch maybe. Okay. Do it. There's a a giant and a dwarf and an elf. Yes. Hold on. Throw it in. Yes. Do we have time to add any extra touches? Uh, Maybe they joke about a chicken at one point. Okay. Otherwise, like there's something so like low budget fantasy movie about this that I really enjoyed and I think the things that you found boring which were like the endless scenes of him riding through the forest I could have watched that for I don't know how many hours it was just like this is so perfectly what it is and uh, I was such a fan of the music such a fan of the uh, just the you, the hyper editing of the crossbow bolts uh, <laughs> definitely it it uh, it's but it's a little bit of a stretch at 94 minutes uh, this probably should have been like a 62 minute movie, uh, yeah. but, but I really enjoyed it. I would say good, bad. And if it, I'm just listening to the soundtrack, then movie I kind of liked. Yeah. I'm going to say it's a movie I kind of liked, uh, Jack Palance, choose all that scenery, uh, mm-hmm. cool haircuts, uh, chickens, <laughs> magic, you know, it's beyond good and evil and uh, land of darkness, etc. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and- uh, I would say that I, I really enjoyed the movie in that it is ter- all these points are valid there was no, <laughs> no plot to be spoken of the lead character was terrible <laughs> but it, it just had so many choices that were wrong I loved it like every couple minutes I'd be a little bored and I'd be like wow who made that decision who thought that was a good idea and that's what I like about bad movies because I could watch it I could watch that lizard again i could watch all the magic again i could watch that pepperoni elf anytime every cross pulse it like i genuinely two days later want to watch the movie again so i would say some of the best of the bad movie oh yeah this this was the and this was the first time in a long time that i've seen a bad movie and i was like i wish we could have done this on mystery science theater for MSC, i know i kept doing riffs i was yeah. like i should watch it oh no there were so many moments <laughs> where i was like this is the joke i would have done for this, this part is so perfect i know i was just like god this would be so fun to riff yeah oh well but what are you gonna do so, maybe yeah, someday you're, you're welcome guys yeah I mean, thank I guess. you yeah thank you yeah thank you Stuart. uh and thank you to uh our special guest, Felicia Day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. And, uh, you know, and I, that sounds like it's an open invitation for us to have you back <laughs> whenever we want. Yes. So, okay, yeah. As long as you have a bad fantasy movie, especially with Silly String, sign me up. Okay, that's a very specific genre, but we'll see what we can uh-huh. do. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm James, host of Minority Corner, which is a podcast that's all about intersectionality. It's hosted by James with a guest host every week. Discussing all sorts of wonderful issues, nerdy and political, pop culture, black, queer, feminism, race, sexuality, news. You're going to learn your history, their self-empowerment, and it's told by what feels like your best friend. Why should someone listen to Minority Corner? Why not? Oh my God, free stuff. There's not free stuff. The listeners of Minority Corner will enjoy some necessary LOLs, but mainly a look at what's happening in our world through a colorful lens. People will get the perspective of marginalized communities. I feel heard. I feel seen. Like you said, you need to understand how to be more proactive in your community, and this is a great way to get started. Join us every Friday on Max Fun or wherever you get your podcast. Minority, Minority Corner. Corner. Because, because together, together, we're the majority. You wept as we crafted the tragic tale of Jar Jar, a Star Wars story. Yeah. Dude, like he forgives Darth Vader. <laughs> Lisa, see? still love you, yeah. Annie. <laughs> you gasped out loud at the shocking twists of Face Off 2. Face is wild. He takes his kid's face. What? <laughs> now, we're writing an entire screenplay week by week on Story Bricks Season 2, Heaven Heist. Hey folks, Freddie Wong here with some exciting news about Story Break, the writer's room podcast where three Hollywood professionals have one hour to spin cinematic gold. We're shaking up our format by turning Heaven Heist, one of our favorite ideas we've ever come up with on the show, into a full screenplay. Heaven Heist is an action comedy about a crew of misfit gangsters robbing the celestial bank of heaven. Think of Coco meets Point Break. Join us as we write this crazy movie scene by scene and get an inside look at the screenwriting process on our podcast Story Break every Thursday on MaximumFun.org. Uh, well, next on the podcast... Uh, well, you know what? Before we get into the uh, Jumbotrons and such, I want to give an update on the the uh, thing we did for charity, the live stream for charity. Mm-hmm. I want to give a total uh, amount of the money that was raised. Uh, I don't have the winners yet. I will have them next time. But right now, thanks to now the... You, n- now you're talking to you're talking about our Howard the Duck live show, which is still available yes. on the Flophouse YouTube channel. Yes, uh-huh. um, and uh, we encourage people to give uh, to charity, either for hunger relief or to help with racial justice, or you know, whatever charity you thought was needed at this difficult time. And Flophouse listeners, uh, the total. Uh, in receipts that were gotten and i want to also thank audrey who <laughs> went through everything manually and totaled this up um well i mean she used a spreadsheet wow. but uh <laughs> i mean she, wow. she didn't she didn't what use like just sticks that she was collecting well, together I, into bundles I, she had to do a lot of uh data entry uh, which was wonderful of her but um but yes the the machine did the adding um she but, wasn't uh, just making marks on your wall no. Uh, to, to count it. There Scratching too- <laughs> marks into the cell wall of your there, apartment. <laughs> there are too many marks up there already of like being like, ugh, miserable days with Dan. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you weren't, you weren't kept awake at night by the sound of her abacus beads clicking as she tallied <laughs> up the figures. Yeah, mm-hmm. but okay, that's enough preamble. So raised by Flophouse listeners, we have $63,503.38 in total. Plus, on top of that, there's the 10000 that the show is donating. Uh, that was what? split evenly between food bank <laughs> banks and, uh, and bail funds. And so, uh, basically, Flophouse folks uh, donated around $73,000. That's uh, crazy. That's little, insane. That is insane. That, and, and, I, so and I use insane in, in not in a derogatory way about anyone's mental mental abilities but that is like that's a huge amount of money did we expect it be like that uh i thought we could uh you know i thought there might be a good total but uh this yeah you everyone out there exceeded my expectations and i'm so like proud of everybody uh a little data the average donation was around 55 dollars although some do- donated you know up to like a thousand dollars there were some donations in that range uh, from all over Canada, the UK, Taiwan, Hong Kong, New Zealand, Australia. These are some of the places people donated from. And so thank you so much to everybody. Um, thank you. Yeah, and we will have the winners uh, very soon. This the, the totals came in literally like five minutes before I got on the call with you guys, so I haven't... Uh, I w- we, were, we were watching and we saw someone hand Dan a paper, tallying yeah. it mm-hmm. in the moment. Yeah, I uh, I, ju- I just want to say that 
I, I'm, I don't know how everyone feels, but, you know, the last couple of weeks I've felt kind of powerless and trying to find ways that I can help. Uh, and uh, seeing this kind of outpouring of generosity is uh, kind of reaffirming that there's a lot of good people out there. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I, I second that and I second what Dan said and it's already been said well. So I don't need I don't feel like I need to say anything extra except thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and with that, I think we can uh, get on to our Jumbotrons. We have no uh, advertisements this week, but we have a few uh, messages from folks. Uh, so we don't have uh, we don't have any we don't have a Squarespace ad where I can do no, you can't. I, I can't do pepperonielf.com. All right, <laughs> <laughs> Sa save it for. I mean, you, a, a you still can. I mean, it's we we provide I mean, you only shouldn't. the you should save it only no, the no. finest elf cured pepperoni. But uh, so I have a jumbotron. I'd like to. I'll do one if that sounds good to you guys. Sounds great. Yeah. Okay, this yeah, message. I'm okay with it. Okay, great. This message is, Congratulations, Windsor, on your graduation from film school. And the further message is, Congratulations, Windsor, on your graduation from film school. We are so proud of your accomplishment. Even though the entire industry is shut down, we are sure you will find your dream job soon by we, of course, I'm referring to me, parentheses your mom, and my best friend, Judd Apatow. Floppers, please offer a hopeful word since his commencement was canceled. I'm so sorry to hear that, but congratulations. That's great news, and the industry is in a... Is in a Short-term shutdown at the moment, but it will come back. People need entertainment. People need storytelling. And something that I keep uh, saying in conversation with a friend of mine who is a theater director, uh, or rather what I keep thinking of that she said, she said, I have to remember theater companies may be in trouble, but theater will always continue, that theater is not in trouble. And I feel like film is similar. Uh, film companies come and go. Films come and go. But the need for film will always be there. So don't worry. You will get your shot so congratulations that's fantastic yay and uh i have a jumbotron to read as well and i believe this one uh is going to make me stretch my acting chops a little bit and do a voice so let me get this right okay, you but you go. normally you normally do a voice right like you're you are speaking with a voice yeah i do actually you're right elliot thanks for correcting me <laughs> um <laughs> You know what? I'm just going to do that whenever Elliot does it. Like, that'll be the standard now. That's, uh, that's great. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I think I'm ready, guys. Garden Plots with Skeletor is a podcast about gardening hosted by me, Skeletor. Yes, I'm taking time between my attacks on He-Man to help you botanically <laughs> benighted boobs know what it takes to keep a poth pothos alive. Do you want to know gardening? Uh, do you want to know gardening success? Do you want to be kept up to date on my many brilliant schemes? Do you want to be there to witness the crushing defeat of He-Man once and for all? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and become a master of the universe and your garden. So subscribe to the podcast Garden Plots with Skeletor. Uh, you, I had a I, couple. Of, I had a couple of mess ups. Is that okay? Is that? Okay? I, mean, I don't I mean, want to. I don't want to note no, note you to death, but it sounded a little like your normal voice. Ah, uh, interesting. I interesting. Uh, I, I'm for, saying I actually, and this is a compliment. Uh, now I'm going to pronounce it He Man from now mm -hmm, on. Mm -hmm. I was saying He Man, but I prefer He Man. Yeah. I, mean, I will say. I mean, maybe you're going in a different direction with your conception of Skeletor, like a more realistic. Sort of well, less. he didn't sound like he didn't sound like Frank Langella, is what you're saying? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was I was trying to really diverge from Frank Langella's performance. Okay, yeah, you got to make it your own. Yeah. Uh, you know. well, okay. Well, what we do now is we have letters from uh -huh. listeners, listeners like you. Maybe if you send in a letter, I can't guarantee it. You know. <laughs> you know, it's Dan. Not, no. It seems yeah. to me. Okay, Stuart, cue the, the fife music. There is a legend from long ago, a legend of the letters. Words on parchment sent along on Ravenclaw or the winds of the west. 
nest. These letters reach the eyes and ears of floppers here and floppers here. These letters carry the magic of communication all across the land. When the shadows hang along the mountains and gargarol, the conqueror sweeps in with his mighty hordes to burn your village and kill your children. Well, there's a letter you can write to the flop house. Tell us about what happened and though we can't stop the bad guy, we can tell you, hey, that stinks. So send us a letter, a missive, or perhaps just throw some words into the scrying pool at the edge of the haunted glen. Perhaps we'll hear it then. Letters. Oh, I forgot you were a villager in the Middle Ages. You can't write and we can't read. Oh. <laughs> Oh, Thank you, Stuart, for the accompaniment. The music from <laughs> Hawk the Slayer. Uh, beautiful. Um, so this first letter is from Ari, last name withheld, who writes, After a year of trying to convince me to check out a podcast, any podcast at all, but yours specifically, I finally caved to my partner's whims and listened to 2014's A Talking Cat on a road trip to NYC. I cried with laughter, and now, much like a baby chick imprinted on my three flophouse mamas, I refuse to follow anyone else. Lately, I've been listening in bed at night, and the best things happened. My anxious fever dream mind chills out to your apparently soothing AF voices, and I fall into the sweetest of dreams. What I'm trying to say is flophouse seems to be a cure for the nightmares I've been having the last few years, so thanks for that. Which leads me You're to... You're welcome. What are your favorite dream sequences... Or which do you consider best slash worst in film? Love ya, Ari. Um, I, I you know what uh, springs to mind is uh, there of course is the dream sequence in Spellbound, the Hitchcock movie mm-hmm. that was uh, designed by Salvador Dali, which is uh, lovely and uh, very Dali esque and uh, and you know I love I love dream sequences that are. Largely, like, I don't know, like people running around with giant cardboard eyes in the background and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> I also remember that, like, people gave Inception a lot of shit because they're like, oh, you know, like, this is not how dreams work. It's not that dreamlike, whatever. And I'm like, and I thought that was so uh, uh, alien to my own experience because I was like, no, I mean, when I dream, like, the everything around me is fairly realistic it's just that geography doesn't make sense and time periods merge and like you know like stuff like that happens you know like plot lines seem to make sense in the moment but not later on when i'm thinking about them but it's Mm -hmm. not like interesting interesting i I I have a rebuttal to this in a moment okay go on i mean i'm just saying that i don't like dream in sort of like a terry gilliam-esque sort of uh fantastic universe or anything like that you don't have an imaginarium that's what you're saying no, <laughs> Doctor Parnassus does not show up. Now here's the now I my favorite dream sequence in movies is similar. My favorite is in the original Manchurian Candidate when they're having dreams that have been implanted by the brainwashers, the commie brainwashers, but their real their real memories are leaking through, and so they're remembering being stuck uh, at a garden convention with a bunch of uh, ladies talking about flowers that are actually communist agents talking about assassination. And what I like about that is, like Dan is saying, it is not shot woozy or, like, gooey. It's, like, it, it's very matter-of-fact, but the things that are happening are somewhat bizarre, that the, that the imagery is, but it's shot in a matter-of-fact way, and it's just a strange situation that feels real. On the other hand, here's my issue with the dreams in Inception, because that's what I was going to say is not the worst dream sequences in movies, not at all, but that... My problem with the dreams in Inception are they are so not personal to Killian Murphy because we're supposed to be in his head, right? Yeah. Uh, And it's like when I have dreams, the people in it are people I've known. The situations are situations I've been in. And it's it's not like it's not like Willy Wonka Phantasmagorical or anything. But I don't have a dream where it's just an action sequence from a James Bond movie on the snowy slopes of the Alps or like a dream sequence where it's just a nondescript office building or a hotel. Like my dreams are – places (laughs) places <laughs> I've been and people I know in new configurations. And so, like I've had so many dreams about working, being at The Daily Show and being like, I don't work here anymore. Why do I have to write a script now? Yeah. Like, then they're like, where's yeah. the script? Rehearsal's in 10 minutes. Like, I would have rather Inception had a lot of dreams where he was like disappointing his family or like having trouble at work or things like that. You know, dream stuff. But it would still be shot the same way. Yeah. Yeah. 
What do you think, Stu? So I would say uh, you guys are both wrong. The uh, the best <laughs> the best dream sequences in film. Uh, the, the number one uh, involves <laughs> a hamburger getting up off of a grill <laughs> and playing. Everybody wants some. Now is that I mean, a dream sequence? Day, day, dr- daydream. Yeah, that's a daydream. Mm, okay, uh, I didn't realize that's how we were splitting <laughs> airs. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, I don't know, runner-up is, I guess, uh, the Masquerade Ball in Labyrinth. Uh, now, I was going to assume that you would pick something from the Nightmare on Elm Street series, since there's so many dreams oh, in that. Oh, you would think that, wouldn't you? <laughs> now uh, I feel like I'm stereotyping you. I apologize. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, like it's my understanding that he's not such a Nightmare fan. And uh, you know what? I used to be with him... I'm just not uh, into a bad guy whose arms stretch out that far. It's too scary. No. <laughs> That's the thing. Like everyone talks about uh, how scary the first one is. I'm like, really? Have you seen those uh, janky long arms that he has? Uh, but I do. I do I mean, like the, the fact wi- that he's a, the fact that he's a villain who wears a sweater and a hat is right off the bat takes the scariness yeah. down a little bit for me. I do like the weirdness though of the later uh, uh, nightmare movies where it, where it's really like fantasy horror weirdness and you know people are turning into uh <laughs> um exercising cockroaches that get trapped in a roach motel like that's pretty great um, yeah, it's, it's a good series of movies uh, okay <laughs> so moving on to the next letter uh this is from seth last name withheld who writes, I was pleased to hear that Elliot's kid has been watching slash listening to Newsies. I credit the original Disney motion picture with radicalizing me as a child. It taught me that even the seemingly powerless could prevail over injustice if they stood united. And also that Santa Fe was allegedly dope. That healthy base of Newsies mixed with the punk music of my teenage years turned me into the godless anarchist I remain to this day. So my question for all of you is as follows. Are there any movies that you watched as a child that, looking back, you believe shaped your moral compass? Or kid-friendly movies that have come out since your childhood, which the parents among us could use to prime the next generation of floppers to be respectable young radicals? No gods, no masters, Seth last name withheld. Uh, I was thinking about this, and it was hard for me to think of specific movies that shaped my morality, because I feel like my morality was so shaped by Marvel comic books and mm. the, the tenets that Spider-Man particularly espoused, uh, and to a lesser extent Captain America. But uh, I would say uh, I, a movie I was going to mention uh, when I just knew the question but didn't know the whole context was Newsies, because ironically, I think Newsies, not ironically, uh, strangely, Newsies has been really helpful in explaining to Sammy kind of what's going on with the Black Lives Matters movement and those protests uh, to kind of help him understand why a protest happens and what mass action looks like and kind of who does it. And Newsies is, is a good primer on that, which is which is ironic because Disney is such a notoriously and traditionally anti-union company. Like literally the, the, the crisis moment when Walt Disney was there when, was when the animators tried to unionize and he had a had a basically like a panic breakdown and it was never quite the same there ever since but uh i would say that a movie that came out that i am looking forward to re-showing my son because he was a little too young when i showed it to him the first time is the iron giant which is, i've always found really beautiful because partly because it it's really spreads a healthy disrespect for national intelligence and military leadership and the idea of uh military strength as the go-to for how you should interact with the world but that the uh, the whole message of the giant being basically a living weapon who chooses to turn off that programming and sacrifice himself, and at the end when when he's remembering Hogarth saying "You are who you choose to be," and he and he sacrifices himself to save the town, like I cry every single time, and I just think it's a beautiful movie about uh, a character who, when he resorts to violence, he knows he's, he knows he's making a mistake, and he needs to not do that, and that the way he can best help people is by uh, not being a killing machine, but instead uh-huh. being a, like a real hero. So I really like that movie a lot. Again, it's a little too violent. I showed it to him when he was younger. It, was a little, it is a little too violent for young, young kids because there's a ton of explosions and stuff, especially at the end. But anyway, that's the movie I would say. Uh, I, you know, I'm having a hard time with this one too because, I mean, partly because I have a hard time remembering 
what my favorite movies were when I was genuinely young. Like, I remember that once I was sort of in my teens, the movies I watched over and over again were Heather's, Aliens, and, uh, uh, shoot, Army of Darkness, which I don't think any of those are necessarily uh, what you should turn to for moral guidance per se. I don't think they're... <laughs> I think they're amoral movies. Uh, well, well, in some ways. I mean, but, uh, somewhat. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, um, Army of Darkness is. If you were like, what's the message of that movie? You'd be like, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, and the thing is, like, stuff I really dug as a kid. You know, like Sherlock Holmes and Uncle Scrooge kind of gave me a lot of the wrong lessons about overvaluing um, intelligence and money. So I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, pivot and use this as a um, way to uh, compliment my family, you know, my, my uh, father and mother who, like, um, were religious but not in any sort of exclusionary way in, in sort of, like, I feel like the purest uh, vision of the best parts of Christianity where uh, all... Are deserving of love and care and uh, not to be discriminated against and uh, my brother is showing me that sort of love and I remember uh, my brother John um, saying you know like you're gonna grow up you're gonna fall in love with people maybe you're fall in love with a, a, a man maybe you're which means that you're you're gay and but it doesn't matter you know I will love you no matter what that is fine and uh, to have that message given to me um, when I grew up in the middle of the country, let's say, where such things were not uh, uh, a message given out as much as it should have been, um, particularly when I grew up, uh, was a wonderful gift. And so maybe we shouldn't <laughs> look to Hollywood movies for our moral lessons because often they have really weird hidden ones that aren't so good. Now, I, technically, Dan, I think you should, if you're going to be giving your family a shout out, that's a jumbotron. But I oh, guess yeah, we Elliot all did it. <laughs> we all did it. <laughs> the hat uh, trick. No, and I'm that actually like leads uh, to what I was going to say. I feel like so much of uh, so much of the movies I watched growing up, I've had to like deprogram myself from. Yeah. Uh, you know, growing up in a you know a house with uh, you know just my younger brother. I feel like there. I didn't have a lot of uh, feminine influences in my life, and I had. Uh, I've had to learn, unlearn a lot of uh, dumb bullshit in my head over over the years. Well, I think what what you're saying, what Dan's saying, are both of a piece in that. Like, you can't. You. I don't think that the question writer is is saying that they're going to do this, but you can't outsource teaching morality to your children to entertainment or any kind of culture like that's the responsibility of a parent to lead them through it and also to be yeah. there so that when they're watching things you can parse it with them and say like this part interpret it yeah this this part uh, you have to understand this way this part you have to understand this way and like to uh to be ready to disavow things that you might love that are not that don't have that proper message i mean like there are certain things that i'm really looking forward to showing my kids but they have to be old enough that i can talk to them and say okay this is why this is not how you interact with the world. Like this is uh -huh. this is not something to to draw. That's why from. these nerds should not be getting revenge. <laughs> well, we are not watching well, those movies for a variety of reasons. I mean, they're they're not, not in good. Not the manner but... in which they go about it. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh boy. Ah, but even like there's stuff like uh, even movies like RoboCop, which ostensibly have like an anti corporate and anti. Um, anti-police message to a certain extent yeah. there's still underneath yeah. it there's still that subtext that violence is the solution to problems and like that's not uh -huh. the, the, the subtext to so many movies is look at a certain point you have to shoot somebody or punch them and it's something that i've mentioned spider-man comics before like the principles that peter parker espouses are so important to me but i started reading spider-man comics to my kids and i'm like ooh, a lot of this is just him punching or kicking people in the face i think we're going to take a break from these yeah. for a long time yeah. So, so instead, we're mostly reading uh, old Fantastic Four comics, in which there's not that much hitting, and there's a surprising amount of just meeting people from other, meeting new types of people and liking them. Yeah, you're not just reading Bone over and over or something. <laughs> we ha we actually we haven't we haven't started reading Bone. I do want to read that to them. 
Um, okay. Unless that one's not okay anymore. Is there new stuff about Bone that I should know? No, it's okay. Okay. Let's move on to the final segment. Okay. Oh, to be honest, I should say, people might find this interesting that, uh, the one comic book thing that my kids want me to read to them over and over again is, there's an issue of Silver Surfer that I have in a trade paperback that Jim Starlin wrote and Ron Lim drew, where the Impossible Man sings his parody version of Make Him Laugh from Singing in the Rain, and every single morning, it'll be like six in the morning, Gabriel will wake up. He's like almost one and a half now. No, he's almost two now. He's over one and a half. He's almost two now. And he'll be like, he'll be like Silver Surfer, make him laugh. Sing it. And I'll start, <laughs> I'll start saying he's like, no, in the book. And so I have to go get the book and like open it up so he can look at it. And so that's, that's the, so if you're looking at the uh, Venn diagram of culture that is interesting to my almost two year old right now, it is yeah. uh, Singing in the Rain and The Impossible Man. Yeah. And where that, when, where that overlaps is what he's really into. Uh, now we talk about movies that we would like to recommend that, let's say you could watch in addition to Hawk the Slayer. If you yeah, have, yeah, yeah. Let's pretend we all have infinite time and we can watch whatever. Uh, what and else? And infinite jest. Yeah, and infinite jest. Sitting on our uh, bookshelf, maybe we got mm-hmm. 90 pages into it and uh, thought, mm, this isn't going enough of anywhere that I care about. I'll just go back and read some of the essays instead. I mean, I'll admit I have never, never even cracked open the book. I'll, yeah. I, it's one I never made it past looking at it at the book on the bookshelf and being like, "Hmm, that seems like a lot of book." <laughs> uh, to what I'm like, end? Who's the? I'm like, who's the bad guy? Is it zombies? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is it a wizard? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell from the jacket, so I'll just put it back on the shelf. <laughs> Is it a guy named Jest who lives infinitely? <laughs> mm, I'm, not get, I'm not getting a poison flower duel vibe from this book. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, I, I don't have a, a full-throated recommendation this week, but I could Just not sleep. Just half-throat it. Half-throat it, Dan. I'll half-throat it. So uh, this week, I, no, I don't like that either. Um, <laughs> no. This uh, yet last night, I could not sleep, as I imagine uh, many of us have gone through from time to time during this uh, extremely stressful part in uh, our nation and the world's history. Um, and so I watched uh, Knock Off, the Jean Claude Van Damme movie, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, with Rob Schneider as well. Uh, how do you pronounce the director's name? I'm not really. It, it's oh, no, a, it's, it's pronounced Rob Schneider. Okay, no, no, it's a uh, Sui Hark. Sui Hark. Oh I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, well known, well known uh, 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 martial arts uh, mostly director. Um, he did Once Upon a Time in China. Uh, he did Iron Monkey. He did a bunch of stuff. Uh, and he also made a couple movies with Van Damme. Uh, yeah. This one and Double Team. And um, look, I'm not going to make a lot of uh, 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 claims for this movie. At a certain point, oh, I you're just not. lost. <laughs> no, at a certain point, I completely lost track of what was supposedly happening. And uh, there's a little less crazy action in it than I would like for a movie that has these sporadic, amazing uh, bursts of crazy action. But it is a movie about uh, knockoff jeans uh, that one might wear uh, that have uh, nanobot explodey things in them. Bombs, I guess they're called. Although, you know, explodey things is something I'm trying to get to catch on. And, yeah, uh, you can do it. And there's a point at which um, uh, Rob Schneider whips Van Damme's butt with an eel. So if you know that's something you can't sounds great you can't buy you just can't buy it anymore. No, you can buy it. You can you can buy it. You can buy this movie. (laughs) Oh right. Yeah. I thought you meant that I could get on like a cameo with Van Damme and Rob Schneider. Possible. I don't know. And an eel maybe. Certainly (laughs) possible. It's just just, probably the cheap. There's they're offering they're offering cameo Zoom calls now (laughs) where you can have a chat with Jeremy Piven for like fifteen thousand dollars for ten minutes. Pay to not talk to Jeremy Piven? <laughs> uh, that's twenty thousand dollars, Dan. I'm oh, sorry. Shit. Well, it's worth it. <laughs> um, I just I like Dan that you're like this is the movie. You can't buy that kind of thing. Well, then how, wait. So is it not a movie that exists? <laughs> Actually, it is on Amazon Prime. So if you're paying for Amazon Prime, sure, uh, you can you can see it right now. Uh, guys, what do you have to recommend, Stuart? I'm gonna point to you. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna recommend a thriller from 1992 called Deep Cover. That's right. Uh, directed by Bill Duke, uh, who's a character actor and a director. Uh, you might know him from Commando. You might know him as Mac from Predator. 
Um, and deep cover is, uh, as you would imagine, it's about a, uh, it's a, about a damaged, but idealistic police officer who played by Lawrence Fishburne or Larry Fishburne as the credits, uh, call him. And that's he, how he used uh, to go. That's what he used to go by. He goes undercover and becomes a drug dealer, uh, working alongside, uh, Jeff Goldblum. And it's two, uh, two great actors at kind of like kind of peak sexiness maybe not for gold bloom you know he's been you know you know the fly and earth girls are you know he's great so you're um, saying his, his peak sexiness was in earth girls were easy where he was kind of like a, a covered in blue fur or the fly I where mean, he was half that fly is, i mean yeah. those are sh- very short parts of their respective movies <laughs> mm, i yeah, guess but what, that's i mean unless what i'm into the fly is about him turning into a fly yeah, yeah. but i mean so, he, he gets shaved pretty early in earth girls are easy uh, but Deep Cover is like a like a '90s noir. The soundtrack is great. Uh, it's uh, shot really well. It's got so many awesome like lurid colors. Uh, it's just a beautiful looking movie, and it's edited well, and it kind of all fits together with this like pulsing uh, soundtrack. Uh, if it's like a little bit grimy and also sexy, it's great. Check it out. Uh, I'm going to recommend a movie from 2015. That's right, 21st century, everybody. Wow. Uh, yep, I'm going to recommend the do movies. I get the, do I get the old movie prize of the episode? I think you do. Yeah, strangely enough. How, cool. What's going on? I'm going to recommend the movie Slow West, uh, starring uh, Cody Smith-McPhee. That's right, the second Nightcrawler, and Michael Fassbender. That's right, the uh, guy from Prometheus. What was the character's mm-hmm. name? Uh, uh, Michael? Prometheus Jones. Prometheus Jones, yeah, uh, and it is a kind of, uh, it's uh, written and directed by John McLean, or, or McLean, I don't know exactly how it's pronounced, but uh, it's a sort of... Uh, Prometheus Jones sounds like a 2000 AD comic. <laughs> yeah, it does. It does sound like a 2000 AD comic, uh, and he's like an amoral, uh, like, what, interplanetary, like, gambler and bounty hunter, something yeah. like that? Yeah, And they're nice. supposed to be funny, but you're like, is this, where are the jokes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it is about a, it's kind of a picaresque, uh, Western about a, uh, Scotsman, a young man who goes out to the American West to find his, the woman he loves who has run off after, uh, a misunderstanding, uh, in their native Scotland and finds himself so incredibly ill-equipped for existing out on the frontier and, uh, gets matched up with Michael Fassbender's character who is a bounty hunter who at first is helping him because he knows, but the Scotsman doesn't know that there is a bounty on the woman that he's looking for, and this guy's going to lead him right to it. But they come to uh, help and appreciate each other eventually, and it feels a little bit like if the more, if the less goofy moments of uh, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs was a full movie, then it might be something like this. It's called yeah, slow. It's called Slow West, but it's not actually that. Sl- I put off watching it for a while because I was worried it was going to be super slow, but it's actually yeah. not that slow. It moves at a at a at a very easy but nice pace. And uh, there's some really cool choreographed uh, kind of shoot 'em up scenes, but there's also some sweet stuff in it and some funny stuff in it. And I ended up liking it a lot. And uh, what's uh, what's that other guy that's in that movie? <laughs> uh, I mean, Ben Mendelsohn's in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is well, that the guy that you referred to? I mean, there's other guys yep. in it. It's not just the three guys, yep. but. <sighs> no, but what if it was a stage play of three guys? <laughs> Three, yep. Yeah. Who, who would who to think? I mean, that's there are lots of stage plays that are just three guys, but yeah. So guys, like if Waiting uh, for Godot had oh, one less yeah. guy, oh, it would just be three yeah, guys. Yeah. Um. Well, unlike uh, our wonderful guest Felicia Day, I don't have to uh, feed a child or attend to my crockpot uh, chicken dish that mm-hmm. she mentioned before the show. But it is very hot in this room, so we should sign off soon but i did want to say another thank you to everyone who uh donated as part of our fundraiser or you know would have donated anyway but saw fit to enter our raffle which is wonderful uh as elliot put it last time there are other reasons better reasons than to enter a raffle to donate to charity um (laughs) and uh we did get um it was around a thousand one hundred uh uh emails so we will be doing that uh, reading of uh, The Boy Next Door, which is something that we have to work out amongst ourselves. Uh, I was, I it was literally a couple nights ago that I was suddenly, I was, you had told us the, the kind of early tally, and I was like, this is great. And I was bragging to my wife, and I was like, we did a great job. And oh, no, now we have to do that Boy Next Door thing. 
It like yeah. just it just dawned on me like oh we have to go through <laughs> with it now. Yeah, yeah, we got to figure that my, out. It wasn't my incessant text messages. <laughs> I mean, wait, the text messages when you were like, hey, boy next door. Hey, boys, next door. You were just so excited about it. Let's get uh, next door with that boy. And I'm like, okay, Stu, uh-huh. okay. Well, so, like, I don't know about this emoji combination, but I think he's trying to say the boy next door. He's like, well, he put a boy, a neck, and a door. I assume that the <laughs> neck is for next, but... Oh, wait, no, okay, now it's a, it's, it's a boy sign, and then an exit sign, and then a okay. nest and then a door, and I guess uh-huh. the nest probably should have been before the exit sign, so I could kind of mush them together. Yeah, okay, well, this I'm one right really, here. I'm not good at it. This <sighs> this one, it's it's a butt and binoculars. Oh, I guess God. that's because he's huh? stalking Jennifer Lopez. This is, his emojis are I mean, there isn't technically a butt emoji, is there, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess it was a peach emoji, probably, there's right? There's a peach. Um, uh, for peaches, the original peaches. Anyway... Uh, <laughs> Also, wait, are yeah, we butts? Yeah, we are no, three no. butts. Well, like, we are three butts. We are three butts. I mean, we have them. I, uh, I like Dan that you had to make sure that t- we knew that peaches were the original peaches. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we, I mean, we haven't. I, I just wanted to say too. Like, I think this succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, we haven't discussed it. I don't want to commit us to anything, but I think that if the world continues to be crazy, we probably will do another thing at some point along similar lines. So, thank you for. Uh, making it wonderful, and um, yeah, uh, I mean, and you don't have to if you if you missed the original contest, you don't have, does doesn't mean you're not allowed to donate to charity. Uh, mm-hmm. That I believe is the list of charities still up on the website, Dan. Uh, yes, and if you missed the original broadcast, uh, we should reiterate that it is up on our YouTube page, which is youtubecom slash c slash the Flophouse Podcast. But you can also just google it um as with anything these days uh what are you about so, to say Elliot? no i was just gonna say so i was gonna say also like just thank you to everybody and uh please keep the generosity going and we probably will do hopefully the world will fix its problems in the next month or two <laughs> and we'll never have to do that again but if the world doesn't fix its problems then i think yeah we should try to do something uh you know Hey, check out the other great podcasts at MaximumFun.org. Thank you for uh, uh, being our network. Thank you for all that you do. Thanks to Jordan Cowling for um, the, uh, the the work that she does on the show, uh, producing it. I want to thank, again, as long as we're talking about the, um, the live show, I want to thank on the show as well as we did on the live show, uh, Matt Carmen and John Holt for all the tech stuff they did for us and the animations. And, uh, yeah. uh, and Tony Oker for supplying the intro that we always use in our shows anyway now that that's all done thank you the listener for listening and thank me dan mccoy for being here <laughs> and, and thank me Stuart wellington for being here and i guess i'll get i'll jump on this self-thanking train yeah, and i'll, try it. And try I'll it, say Elliot. i'll say thanks first i'll say thanks again to to our guest felicia day and i will say thanks thank you hawk for being the slayer we all needed you to be. I'm Elliot Kalin for Flophouse News. Dan? Good night. Bye. Listen, I was just a, a, a little villager with a little tent and a dream, and I caught those butterflies, and I mined those or- rocks, and I played that <laughs> terrible turnip game, but I did it. <laughs> I did it for my baby. I mean, it sounds like a great game. MaximumFun.org. Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.